Hi, my name is Tel Koenderink and I'm the founder and master trainer of Novilo, where we guide schools, teachers and parents in creating a space for gifted and talented kids. Hey, what I want to share with you today are stories of three different gifted and talented kids. And why I do this is to show some extremes of different ways of guiding kids. I do want to warn you because some of these stories, they don't really end as positively as you would want. So if you're kind of sensitive, maybe you should, you know, think of not watching this because it, it, it's pretty intense to watch, especially if you've had kind of a negative history with giftedness and you got stuck yourself or maybe one of your children. So think of it, maybe let your partner or somebody else watch for you to decide whether it's a good idea. But it's a very valuable lesson. So I hope you can really, you know, go through this. So I want to share with you the lives of William, David and Kim. Kimberly. A little William, David and Kimberly are three kids and we're going to start with William and David. William has been raised by his parents with one single focus. William should get the chance to express himself. He should get the chance to let everything that's inside of him out. And because his parents, one of them is a developmental psychologist and the other is a lawyer, the dream of every teacher I can tell you. Um, they really put their best foot forward to also make sure that the school confirms to this view. The school also works at, you know, letting William express himself. At the under, other end of the spectrum, we've got David. And he's been raised in quite a more old-fashioned style. Don't do weird stuff. You know, his father is an old-school principal. And the philosophy is, you know, if somebody doesn't get the school performance, only two reasons. Either you're too stupid or too lazy. And so David has to choose which of the two he is. And we're going to follow them through their school period. And we start, so we're starting with the first day at school. William comes into the classroom and the entire classroom is sitting in a circle. And he joins them. And you know, the teacher asks, so who of these kids knows what day it is today? And she hasn't finished asking a question. Or William gets upset. I do, I do, I know, I know, I know, I know. Today's Monday. Tomorrow is Tuesday and the day after is Wednesday. And I can tell you in French too. So, you know, the teacher in the classroom is like, oh wow, this guy is intense. But, you know, they, they're going on. And, but with every question the teacher asks, William is again, yeah, I know, I know. He pushes his hand in his face and he's like, yeah, I know. So all the kids are looking at him like, this guy is a little weird. And it doesn't help his social acceptance. You know, kids are kind of weary of this. Then we get David, different classroom, enters the classroom, sits down, and the teacher also asks, what day is today? And at the end of the day, David gets home. And he's talking with his mother and he said, yeah, you know, the teacher asked me what day is it today, but I looked around and none of the older kids knew the answer, so I figured I'd kind of not tell them as well. At the first day in school, kids already start showing underperformance. They make a choice. Am I going to go with my social acceptance? Or am I going to go with my expression and showing what I've got cognitively? And some kids really make a pretty profound choice there. And they stick with it for a long time. And then it's time to learn how to read. Well, for William, this is not a problem because he's been, you know, pampered and held by his parents. So he already knows how to read. And he comes to school and... His, his mother comes along to explain to the teacher that, you know, the normal reading methods, she doesn't agree with the system, so he shouldn't have to go through them. And, you know, the teacher is still kind of hesitant, saying, you know, well, all the kids go through this. But then William's father comes in as well and says, no, this will not happen with my son. So what do they do? They're like, well, he can read already, so why would we bother him with all the boring lessons? So they skip the entire program, he reads what he wants to read. But the problem is, in the beginning, he's the fastest student. After a while, he's a mediocre student. After a while, he's one of the slowest students with a lot of, you know, untidiness and faults in his work. So what happens is he didn't change because he never really consciously learned how to read. He doesn't know how to improve it. For David, something else happened because David came into school and it was time to read. So he did his reading lessons and came home and said, Mom, I learned to read my first word today. Cool, no? And his mother is like, 
David, this morning we were reading the newspaper together. You know, a new healthcare administration order has been instituted. And David's like, well, well, no, mom, but you don't get it. There's two types of reading. There is home reading and school reading. And reading newspaper is home reading. And reading at school is school reading. But the problem is, after three months, David forgot he knows how to home read. Because the teacher told him, this is the right way to read. But the thing is, David lost two things. He lost one, his superior ability to read, because he had an awesome reading strategy. And on the other hand, he lost his faith in his own approach. Because now he believes that if the teacher has a way and I have a way, then the teacher is right. Because I always should do it the way the teacher asks me to do it. And if he ever gets a question, something that he hadn't, didn't have in school yet, his only answer is, I don't know, the teacher didn't tell me yet. So it's a very different mindset. And now it's time for multiplication tables. And of course you can imagine William, William, you know. He does not like repetitious work, so he should not have to do that. And if you look at William, then underneath the table he's still counting all the multiplication tables on his fingers. You know, he's not doing them in a structural way whatsoever because he's calculating them anew every time. Which means that he makes a lot of mistakes as well. But yeah, you know, of course his mother came by and explained, no, it's not allowed to make him do repetitions because gifted kids hate repetitions. And therefore he's, he's got trouble with multiplication for the rest of his life. David gets the other end of the spectrum though, because old fashioned school, he gets five pages of multiplication so he can practice. He does a first page, he is pretty good, <clears throat> almost faultless. But by a second page, he's getting bored. Third page, fourth page. Uh, by the end of the last page, he's got, you know, like 20 mistakes. And the teacher is busy that week, so he figures, you know, I'm not gonna check all the pages, I'm just gonna check the last one. So he checks David's last page. Oh, David, you made 20 mistakes. Well, that means you don't really grasp the concept of multiplication yet. So you know what we'll do? You'll do another three pages. <laughs> Not quite the ideal approach. And David, even more discouraged, doesn't get a lot better at this either. And he starts hating the teacher more as well. But by now it's time for an IQ test. Because, hey, these kids are kind of bright and maybe we should test them. So they're sent off to a testing agency and they're both tested. And William is tested. But what the person administering the test is noticing is that he's really, really speeding along. He's going through it at a rapid pace. And, you know, the administration person is asking, like, maybe you want to slow down a little bit and check your work. He's like, no, no, it's fine. Bang, 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 bang. And what turns out, his mom said to him, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do with this test because I know you're gifted anyway. And you know what? When we're done, we'll go buy McDonald's and you'll get your favorite meal. So the other thing that William is focusing on is getting through as fast as possible. He ends up with a score of 132. But, you know, the person who administered the test checks and sees that in just stupid mistakes that he could have avoided by checking it once, he could have had a 30, 139. But that's like a 7 point difference. But now he made 132, so he's in the gifted program, it's all no problem and stuff like that. But what if it had been the other way around? And he had another 24. And there was some kind of an IQ range demand on whether or not he could enter the program. David has another pro problem. Because when he comes in and they tell him about the test, they're like, oh, this is a really, really difficult test. So David starts. And the first question is so obviously simple. He's like, how could... It, the, the simple answer couldn't be the right one because they told me this is a hard problem. So he's going to work and he's thinking about it, he's thinking about it. He comes up <clears throat> with a difficult solution. But a difficult solution is the wrong one because he thought about it for such a long time. It's a very creative solution, but not the right one. And the problem with a lot of IQ tests is that if you've got two mistakes in a row, then you're going on to the next part because they get increasingly harder. So they don't want to bug the kid too much. So because it gets harder, they don't want to discourage him all the way through. But what happens with David? He has a mistake on the first two questions. 
the simple ones. So they skip the entire area and they go on to the next. He scores 87. 87! And this, even his parents think is weird because he definitely is an 87 kid. So they go to a different place, he gets a different test, but he gets two changes. One, they say it's a difficult test, but it starts really simple because even you know less fortunate kids should be able to get some right. So give the thing you think that the test maker wants to know. You know, a simple, reasonable answer. And the second thing they do is they give him three or even four mistakes in a row before they go on to the next level. Second IQ test, he fil fil finishes it. And you know what he scores? 139. 87, 139. Just by administering the test in a different way. Helping him understand how the test works a little bit better. So, they come back in school and now it's time for a creative project. You know, they should create a paper because, you know, they're so smart, they should be able to do that. Well, no doubt what William is going to do because the focus on expression. Well, what William actually does is he copies from Wikipedia and he co copies from Google Images and, you know, he hands it in. And the teacher wants to be, you know, kind of strict about it, but then she thinks about the mom and that there would be an enormous discussion. So she's like, yeah, it's fine, you get an A. And a week later, he creates another paper and he gets an A again. He doesn't learn anything because he writes about what he already knows. And he doesn't even write it, he just copies and pastes it. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got David. And he gets to do a paper as well. And he wants to do it about the universe, the entire universe in one paper. Well, he starts it, but the teacher says it's important that you use sources. You need to be able to refer to sources. And you're not going to do the universe, it's too big, you should do it about the moon. Well David's like, oh cool, the moon, I just saw a program on Discovery Channel about the moons, about 30 moons in a year, and I want to put that in my paper. But then the teacher says, ah, sources are important, and the teacher gives him a third grade book <laughs> on the moon. And the book starts with, a month is called a month because it's the cycle of the moon. But now David is confused because he's like, well, but there are 13 moons and 12 months and now he tries to write this paper in such a way that he can put what he knows in with the 13 moons but he tries to refer to the book as its source and it, it becomes really messy and then the teacher looks at it and says it maybe was a bit too difficult for you David you know a, bit, a little bit too high maybe we'll make it a bit simpler next time you know no papers for you it's too hard for you so again too 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 strict too free they're both not good so it's almost the end of the elementary school. It's time for the, the standardized test to figure out, you know, what high school should we go to? And William, again, races through the test. Why? Because his mom told him, it doesn't matter what you score for this test. It doesn't matter because I already arranged for a special place in the special program of this and this school. So he really gets a crappy score. But yeah, it doesn't matter because he goes through anyway. Helps to have a lawyer as a dad. David is less fortunate because he does his final test but with only one question in mind. What did the teacher say about this? He doesn't think about the right answer. He just tries to remember what the teacher told him that the answer should be. And if he doesn't know it, he doesn't fill it in because otherwise he might make a mistake. And he doesn't score all that well. So he's not allowed into a really good high school either. And by now, you know, we've forgotten about the IQ test. So he goes to a pretty average school. And the beginning of high school, and I don't know, it depends on the country you're living in, but what I see as a general tendency in the education system is that they're getting more and more lenient and they're making it easier and easier. Especially a lot of schools in the first year, the first two years of high school, they give higher grades just to get the kids, you know, to get used to it. But the problem with that is that when they get a little bit further and they're about 15 years old, you know, when they're 12, they're usually pretty open to learning new strategies and learning in a different way. But by the time they're 15, you know, this big, you know, hormone factory is starting to run and they're not as open anymore to changing their ways. But if the first two years of high school were really successful and they got really great feedback, then they're not very likely to change anymore. And this is what you see happening with William. 
because he came into new school, special program, and he started arranging stuff, you know, he's like, no, I made a deal with that teacher, and I made a deal with that teacher, and nobody knows what he's doing anymore, because he's like two years ahead with this, but one year behind with that. But after three years, they're like, well, we have to start working towards a standardized test in the end. So, you know, show us what you can do. And now William is stuck. Because he spent all his time, you know, doing enrichment classes and not showing up for this class and not showing up for that class. But he's lacking foundational knowledge. He doesn't really know what stuff means and what he needs to do. So he becomes a dropout because he doesn't know what to do anymore. And he doesn't know how to go through, he doesn't know how to go back and learn the fundamentals. So he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And David came into school again with that one question. What does the teacher want me to say? And if I don't know the answer, then I'm not going to fill it in. So his grades deteriorate and he's put into, you know, no child left behind or slow kid classes and stuff like that. And he gets even more depressed. And he ends up in some kind of a vocational school hoping that he'll figure stuff out. And he actually finishes high school. But, you know, the lowest level, the lowest type of school there is available. And, you know, the future for the two, well, for William, he does st thing after thing. You know, he goes on a snowboarding course because he wants to become a snowboarding instructor. But just before the exams are there, ah, oh, a friend of mine is in need of help. So, you know, I can't, I can't, just stay here, that wouldn't be responsible, I'm going to go help them and oh, boo, I can't make my exam anymore. And then he does another program where he wants to learn to become a skiing teacher, but just before the exams are there, his knees hurt a little bit, so that wouldn't be responsible, right, to do, you know, something like that. And then he starts this creativity program and to become a creativity facilitator. But just before the end of the year, he drops out because, yeah, you know, these evil people at study administration refuse to give him his grades. And this is the story of his life. He starts stuff up, he never finishes it. Starts up, never finishes it. Until when he's 27, he finally finds out what he wants to do. He wants to become a cook. Such a profound company is, is really successful at it. Even, you know, starts the education part of it, finishes it, high marks. 27. It took him 10 years to get, to get up to speed. And David is even more depressing. Because he's sitting there, he's 18, he finished his high school. And he's sitting in his room, hair down to here. Music on the background, loud metal music. And he's looking at the bottle in his hand antidepressants and he read somewhere on the internet if he just pops the entire bottle it'll all be over and he actually considers it well luckily he doesn't and he goes on and you know what job he ends up in bus driver doesn't need to think too much you know doesn't need to bother with stuff too much every evening he starts drinking a little bit so he doesn't think too much Gets a nice girl, not too smart, who takes care of him, he takes care of her, and he kind of waits out his days. He doesn't know what to do with his talent. He doesn't even know he has talent. If you ask him, he thinks he's stupid. That's why he's on the bus. Such a shame of talent. So our, our hope in, in dark days, of course, is Kim. You know, let's hope that the girl, you know, she does make it. Well, Kim gets a very different treatment because Kim's parents, Kim's father is an athlete. Kim's mother is a professional musician. And they know one foundational fact. A talent by itself is worthless. A talent is only useful when you train the skills to go with it. When you have the attitude and your willingness to work for it. And she goes to a school that also realizes this. So she goes to school, first day in school. She's sitting again in the circle. And again the question, what day of the week is it? And the teacher knows that this is Kim's first day, so she looks at her and she sees that Kim, where most kids, you know, look up or take some time to think about the answer, Kim doesn't. The only thing she looks at are the other kids. So after the circle's over, the teacher approaches Kim and is like, hey Kim, do you know what day tomorrow is? And Kim's like, yeah, Tuesday, no problem. And the teacher's like, hey, why? Why didn't you 
tell me in you know the circle and Kim's like yeah I didn't want to stand out and all the kids might think I'm weird so the teacher makes it around he's like well no this kid is doing a different program because he's good at that and he's doing a different program because he's good at that everybody's different here everybody's unique so you know just do what you can and and that way you don't and that's what she's trying to do, of course. You don't have to make a choice whether you stand out or whether you do what you know. You can do both. You can be integrated into the group and still show what you know how to do. And Kim, same as David. She can school read and she can home read. But as soon as the parents find out, they go to school and talk to the teacher. And they figure out this program where they go through all the steps of the standardized curriculum. But every time she gets to do a test up front to see if she's already mastering this step. And if not, what areas need some working on. So in the beginning she goes through pretty quickly, but after a while she, knows, she learns how to adjust based on you know, what specific areas such as speed or accuracy need changing. And this way she learns how to make best use of her own skills, best use of her own strategies, but, but augment them with what there's to learn at school. And same with multiplication tables. The first thing they do with her is explain why it's useful. It's useful to memorize and repeat them for several reasons. Because you're better at, you know, if you have to raise things to the power at a later point. But also for the mental development of your, you know, repetition skills. Which are automation, automating areas of your brain. Um, it really helps the integration of your brain. Uh, look at the seven challenges to see you know, the difference between comprehensions and memorization, how the two skills should both be trained. So by explaining this to Kim, she understands why she needs to do it. And she actually gets a, a different test as well. She gets the same test as normal, but she gets less time. So she's forced to train it more to be able to reach that new deadline. And then it's time for an IQ test. And Kim has the same problem. She thinks too long, but luckily she gets instructed properly. You know, like David, in the second run, she gets it in the first run. And she's clearly gifted, you know, 142, a pretty good score. So she needs to create a paper as well. But the teacher is thinking about it. And the teacher is, I don't have a lot of materials to really challenge her. But, you know, we've got the internet, we've got some, we've got a library and stuff like that. I'll focus on the pro process. And that's really important as a guiding counselor for a kid focus on the process you don't have to be smarter than the kid you have to be better at process guiding so what she says to Kim is you know first make a mind map about the subject you want to work with you know create some outline or a summary of what you already know and now write down three questions of things you don't know yet and your paper will be about those three questions that's the only thing I want to know what didn't you know and how did you find it out and then Kim creates a paper and she's kind of like William, so she copies and pastes stuff together. And then the teacher says, you know, ooh, she recognizes that it's copied and pasted. Let's create a rule for the next paper. Because when I read something, every paragraph I'll ask you two questions. And if you know the answer, I'll count this paragraph. But if you don't know the answer, I'm going to scrap it because you didn't learn it. The point of you know, doing all the stuff is not to have a paper, but for you to have learned what is in it. So the first time she does that, almost everything gets scratched out, because Kim doesn't know the answers. <laughs> but the second time, she gives it back to Kim, and Kim writes it down in her own words, and she thinks about it, and she processes it more. And now she knows all the answers. So by guiding the process in an intelligent way, which can be done with a lot more complicated and sophisticated models, but she can help Kim forward. So by the end of elementary school, Kim is doing an awesome job. She's really well integrated, motivated, doing all kinds of enrichment stuff. And she's going to the high school. And this high school knows that it's really important to start off at the right level. To immediately start challenging Kim at the level she's not used to maybe from the primary elementary schools. So by the time she's 15 year old, years old, there's no big surprise. It's not like it gets really hard all of a sudden. It's all through in the same line, but by this time, Kim is getting a little bit bored. So by now, she's going to do some additional courses at the local university. You know, she's, she's getting some extra courses and she's already starting some degree work. And by the end of high school, she doesn't need just get her high school diploma, but she also gets, you know, her first year's diploma for the local university in, you know, uh, maths. 
And this way, her future is that she does a double study. study. She studies two subjects at the same time, because she had a head start with one of them. She actually balances both out. And she knows she has to work for it, but she's willing to do that. She loves challenging herself. That's what the biggest value is for her. So, why did I tell you these three stories? I want to point out the risks of the wrong guidance. The wrong guidance being too much freedom, like William. You know, as long as he gets to express himself, we're not going to correct him and we're not going to push him in a certain direction. But also the other side, David. Ah, if we don't see it, you must be stupid and, and we'll, we'll cut you down in all different areas. Because that's awful for his self-esteem. But rather be like Kim. Focus on her having a talent and help her develop the skills and the attitude needed to bring it to fruition. Okay? Awesome. So if you want to learn more about what you can do with this, see the movies about life attitude and whether you should change the school or the kid because they'll give you, they'll give you some you know, handles on how to do this. Thank you so much for listening. I know this has been a long story, but probably there's a lot of recognition in this. So especially if you're a teacher, think of some kids in your classroom. Do they maybe go into the lines of William or David? And maybe you picked up some clues of stuff you can do to guide them more like Kim? Okay, I really hope you do. So you can make this step forward and help kids in an even more profound way. Thank you so much for, look, for being with me. <laughs> Bring out the best in yourself and in each other.